My name is Emily Holland and I'm the editor of Poet Lore, here to welcome you to the Writer Center Virtual Craft Chat series, where we talk with writers a little less about what they wrote and a little more about how they wrote it. Please welcome tonight's guest, Terry Ellen Cross Davis. So excited to have you here, Terry, celebrating your new book, A More Perfect Union. I have my copy here. And please, 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 everyone buy the book. We'll have some links for purchasing through the publisher or through bookshop.org, or of course, uh, head to your independent bookseller locally to support them and Terry as well. Uh, Terry, would you just get us started with introducing yourself and reading one or two poems from this collection? Sure. Hi, my name is Terry Ellen Cross Davis. I'm a poet and mom of two, wife to one, and I am the poetry coordinator for the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C., and I live in Silver Spring, Maryland, but I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio, 216. I don't, gotta love my, my hometown. <laughs> um, so I'd love to start us off with some goddess poems. Uh, I feel like these, these goddess poems um, were so much fun to create and to research. So I'll just do two quick goddess poems, if that's okay, Emily, just goddess of scars and the goddess of anger. So here's the goddess of scars. I mark you with melanin, a cross hatch of collagen, better the scar than the loss of limb, better the clean line, raised itch, festering wound, beckoning death. My apostles, my keloids, my atrophic, my contractures, my hypertrophic response, each a love I bear to the mammal of you, the ruptured vessel, the broken in dermis. Consider my evolution a song to survival. Consider cells my priest, their work a ladder of prayer, each stitch an epistle. I grieve to see you separate from yourself. My atonement is a bridge to build you back together. While you can never be born again, you can recover. Each time I sign you, witness the parable of action and consequence. I do not think you show enough reverence. You were never meant to be a smooth canvas, but a texture, a testament. I bless you with a story and each and every time you live to tell the tale. And so I'll share the goddess of anger. And the goddess of anger. Did he touch you? Did he hit you with jagged words or closed fists? Did he laugh at you? Were you polite even then? Were you lava under the skin? Then let me in, unsheath the dagger of me. You've tasted pain, now let me master it. Let me in. I'll use the dust of his bones for tea. I'll rise vengeful and caustic, a florid fury steeped in seething. I'll make his eyes bleed. Let me in. I'll dissect him unflinchingly. A backhand slap, a rake of fingernails. I'll spit my small mercies. I'll dance on him in stilettos. Paint my toenails OPI red while the blood congeals. Let me be your ignition point, your pitch, the whoosh of hot, sweet breath. I'm all your swallowed heat simmered into flesh. I, too, can lift burdens. Let go of fear, of retribution. Let go of decorum and shame. Ride rage until it bucks, then jump on it again. Damn it, let me, let me, let me in. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for sharing those poems. Um, I love the, the goddess poems that we get throughout the collection. And I think maybe that'll be a good place for us to, to start talking about um, just how did you kind of conceptualize these poems, which act as a thread throughout the parts of the book. Um, and, you know, there's the two that you read, but there's also the goddess of cleaning and the goddess of blood that starts the collection. So could you just talk us through about um, the goddesses as, as a concept for the book? Well, in many ways, they were a long time coming. I had been a huge fan 
of Greek and Roman mythology since I was in grade school and then it expanded to Egyptian mythology. And I was always a comic book fan. My father loved comic books. Uh, my, whole, my, my sister and my cousins, we would read a lot of Marvel, some DC, mostly Marvel, but we would dabble in both. Um, and so that's always been in the back of my mind, just these incredibly powerful beings, the mythology, the lore of it. But it was actually at a dinner with Jane Hirschfeld when I brought her to the Folger to read. And we were talking and I said, you know, there should be a goddess of lust. And she was like, well, why don't you create your own goddess? And I was like, um, that's a great idea. Then it was as if I needed that permission. And once I got that permission, oh, so many voices came up in my head and said, okay, I need to exist. I need to exist. I need to exist. And I thought, yeah, they're, they're goddesses that I think need to speak up for women in places that we haven't had a voice and goddesses that have the power that women have not often had in our patriarchal society. So I wanted to create these powerful women who could, you know, be the goddess, you know, just they could handle retribution, they could handle revenge, they could tell the truth and not be ashamed of it. And so that's, that's where these goddesses came from. Yeah, yeah, that's great. It's, it's one of those things where until someone kind of mentions it, you don't realize how much freedom you really do have to, to create and, and build, you know, what hasn't been built before. And I love the voices that these goddesses bring to the collection and the ways that they transform across the collection as well. Were there others that didn't quite make it in as you were kind of figuring out, um, you know, which voices you really wanted to include here or which voices fit with the overall collection? There were, there's a goddess of hair who never made it in. <laughs> um, and there was just, there's a lot I wanted to talk about, but I couldn't quite figure it out. And then Rita Dove wrote this incredible sonnet that mentioned all the different types of, of hair um, that's used in, in like African-American women with braiding and so forth. And I was like, you know what, done. Um, I don't know what I can do past that. <laughs> So the goddess of hair, unfortunately, did not make it. But I do wonder if there are some others kind of lurking in the background of my subconscious that will kind of make their way out, be born out of my head like Athena was out of Zeus's. Right, right. Yeah, maybe they'll have different lives in, in publications elsewhere or, or something like that. But um, no, that's great. I, I wanted to talk about... Um, the sound play in your poetry, specifically in this collection. And, and since we are so fresh coming off hearing you read some of them, could you just talk about, you know, your ear towards the music of, of the poems and how you kind of uh, architecture the work on the page where there's some end rhyme and some internal rhyme, but really all of those sounds come together to create kind of a, a choral effect in each poem. Well, and thank you for that. I, I, for me, I listen to music every day, every single day. There's, you know, on Spotify, I have, I don't know how many different playlists for different moods. And I'm also a child of the 80s. So hip hop came of, was born and came of age when I was coming of age. So the sounds of hip hop, the, the quick pattern of rhymes, all those things are always playing in the back of my head. As a matter of fact, in our house, I can't say six minutes without my husband chiming in, Dougie Fresh, you're on. Um, and that's what happens. And so it's like, so it's so deeply embedded within us to have that kind of sound play. And I think that plays a huge role in how I think about the musicality of poetry. I, I love rhyme, but I try in many ways to avoid a lot of in rhyme just because I don't want it to fall into the sing song. But at the same time, like, like a black woman gets the window seat on Aer Lingus, that poem needed a quick, quick slashing rhyme just to keep going because I wanted it to tumble down the page. I wanted the emphasis to be there on all those S's. And there are times when I just kind of, the poem, I have to discern what the poem needs. I kind of, it's kind of like being a parent, you know, like to an infant or so, where you don't really, it doesn't, an infant doesn't have the language to tell you. So you have to kind of discern from physical clues and sounds what, what this baby needs. And so each poem is kind of like that for me. I have to figure out how much rhyme can you take? Um, where can you take it? 
is it overburdening you too much? Are you falling down while you should be running? And so um, that's, that's really how I look at it. And like I said, music plays such a huge role in my life. I grew up listening to all different types of music and we fill our house with music all the time. So it has to, it, it, it would inevitably come out in the work. Right, right. There would be no way for it not to make its presence known if, it, if it's that intrinsic to your, your process as well. Exactly. exactly. I love that idea of um, parenting our poems, you know, kind of, <laughs> you know, we usher them into the world in this sort of birth metaphor as well. And this collection really deals a lot with motherhood and specifically black motherhood and what it means. And um, so I think that's a very apt metaphor, especially with these poems. Could you talk a little bit about um, those themes in the book and how you've come to those within this collection, maybe moving from work in your previous collection? Well, a lot of it does have to do with, um, with, with motherhood and with the shock of it in many ways as, as, um, as a black mother in America and just the shock of what you've done. And sometimes, you know, there were times early on where I wondered if it was the right decision just because I was so afraid and I didn't know how I could live a life so afraid with my heart walking outside my body to paraphrase, you know, the, the, the lovely like line that they have about motherhood. Um, but it just, from hate to here, my children matured and I got more time to write. Mm -hmm. um, and so those two things were helpful and I matured and I felt that there were all these different issues at play. And one of the things that really came clear to me with this book was I've had different paths in my life. Um, you know, obviously been daughter, sister, aunt, mother. Um, but I've also had different roles, different jobs. And all of a sudden there seemed to be a weaving together of my identities into one strong thread, into one strong braid of who I really am right now. And maybe that's what the forties do for you. So hello, welcome to the forties. Maybe they're just awesome like that. Um, where you hit 40 and like, I know who I am and I know what I want to say and I know exactly what I want to do. And that's, that's kind of what happened. And I begin to look at motherhood in a lot of different lenses. I begin to look at the influence of Black culture in a lot of different ways. I begin to really think about my background in international affairs, uh, my background working as a congressional page, my background working on the Hill. My, and of course, I'm immersed in poetry all day, every day at the Folger. And so all these things bled into this moment. And those that's that's what made it into the collection everything that i begin to think about even the traveling i mean in in hank i wrote about kenya where i lived for three months during an internship but here i traveled to ireland and it was really great to get away and i'd also travel to london and and to paris although i don't have any london poems i'm sorry <laughs> london um, no offense um but uh yeah it just all everything came to bear on the moment and and I began to realize who I was in that moment and what my voice could do in that moment. Yeah, I, I want to talk about this book as your, your second collection, because I feel like, you know, it, it kind of similar to the sophomore slump when, when an album is released, you know, did you feel a lot of pressure on this book as you were creating it? Or, um, you know, how did you kind of compare the processes between first book to second book? What was your vision going into this one? I, I didn't feel a lot of pressure in one respect because I was just happy to get the poems out. You know, like I was just happy to have the time away to write them. And I would mm -hmm. just marvel over each one. Again, shiny new baby, like, oh goodness, you're awesome. I love you, baby. Um, and so I was just happy to have that happen. Um, and so there wasn't pressure in the creation, but as it came together, I began to fear what would happen to it and if it, it would find a home and if it would find an audience. And so there was that fear, but that was so different from hate, which at least a third to a quarter of hate was my MFA thesis from my um, experience, my time at American University. And then it was just really going back and looking at older poems because I've been writing since, you know, undergrad. 
um, actually since high school, actually since third grade. That's when I wrote my <laughs> first poem. Um, so, so all those poems, you know, and I look back to see if there was anything <laughs> that, yes, who hey you, um, if there was anything that was worth salvaging there. And then I have to give credit to the writer's workshop that I've been in with Kim Roberts. Um, it, it was Anya, Anya, Anya Creighton, uh, Michael Gushu, and Abby Beckel, and at one time Dan Vitta. And so, you know, they kept me honest. They kept me writing throughout the entire time. Even, I mean, it was like the best workshop. They would even come to my house to make it easier for me as a, as a mom and as a breastfeeding mother. <laughs> They, they saw me breastfeed many a time um, in the middle of workshop. <laughs> and so that's why, I, I mean, so if you have to go through all that just to write a poem, there's no pressure about writing the poem. You know, it, it was like, I'm just happy to have it written. Mm. But the pressure did show up when I was like, okay, how is this going to find a home? Where is it going to find a home? Um, and I heard so many things about that second book being really hard to place. But thankfully and luck luckily, that was not my experience. Yeah, yeah. Thankfully, it's here with us. Just another plug, please buy the book. Also want to give a shout out to the AU MFA program. I just turned in my thesis um, this week. So um, joining that, that community of graduates soon. So Yay. It's great to, to have congratulations. You Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's great to know that you had some success with with those MFA poems coming into your first book too. I know there's a lot of pressure on us. We put on our theses to, to become something and, and it's great to see that it, be, it did become something in its own way. Um, I also wanted to pick up, you know, you really mentioned the, the emphasis of community and helping you create these poems. And I listened to your podcast with Black and Published um, today and you mentioned the uh, Black Ladies Brunch Collective as well. And then of course you work at the Folger. So you have all these different communities that you're in. And could you just speak a little bit about what that means to you as a writer and how that impacts your process um, in getting the poems out, but also in building a, a community of um, other people's work that you're in conversation with? Oh my gosh. Um, I have to say Black Ladies Brunch Collective, they're, those, those ladies, those ladies hold me up, you know, and they, and they keep me so accountable, just like my workshop does. And also I have to go back and say, shout out to Kathy Fagan for picking this book for Ohio State University's prize, um, for the journal prize, the Charles B. Willer prize. But yes, um, what I love about BLBC is that everyone writes in very different ways. Anya is a very different writer than Tafisha Edwards. Tafisha Edwards is a very different writer than Saida Agostini. Saida Agostini is a very different writer than Katie Ritchie. And so they each, we each come into it with different ways of looking at poetry and finding our voice within it and different ways we, we try out form and, and topics and just, and just the wide range and just the language itself. Um, and so because I'm in conversation with them a lot and we share poems back and forth and we talk about poetry and we do workshops and we do events. Like we just did a thing for Oh Miami where we did a whole workshop on uplifting the, the black erotic and celebrating black womanhood um, through the body, working with artists to create work to respond to a workshop we did on uplifting the erotic, right? And so because I do these things with them, it stretches me so far. I mean, there are times I'll call to Fisha like, I'm not understanding this poem. Please tell me what is going on. Um, and there'll, time, there'll be times I'll, I'll talk to Saida and it's just like, and she'll be like, okay, what do you think of this poem I just wrote? And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so, you know, incredible. This is just brilliant. And the way she uses her language and just, and how she too has been going back and diving into history and ancestry. These are all things. So it's everything that they do it ends up finding a way, a pathway into my head and into my heart and into my hand because I can't help but absorb all the, all the goodness that surrounds me with these incredible and brilliant women and their work. And so, yeah, that does a lot. And then for a while, reliably at work, every spring I would have a huge writing frenzy because every spring I was reading book after book after book, mm -hmm. trying to find voices to incorporate into the next season. And it, 
it got so reliably an, an occurrence that I actually begin to get worried. <laughs> like only I will get worried at a good thing. Um, you know, <laughs> but I was just like, no, oh, maybe I'm de dependent on this too much. I'm, I'm, I'm too reliant on it. And so I, I just worried if I'd be able to find a, a way into poetry without that. So, but you know, you know, again, why, why mess up a good thing? Um, so <laughs> those, all those different avenues have really helped to create the poet that I am today. That's great. Yeah, I think, especially now with with so many different virtual options as well, that kind of building of community and, and the accountability that comes from having someone looking at your work and you looking at someone else's work is is a great way to to keep writing and keep churning out those poems. I want to um, just remind everyone, if you have questions, please post them in the chat. I do try to keep an eye on all the comments in the chat. So as questions come up, I'll, I'll loop them into our conversation, but um, I have plenty of questions to, to ask. So we won't be short on anything for discussion. Um, I did want to go back a little bit to music because there's quite a lot of music references in this collection. We get prints, we get um, the sort of ekphrastics of different album covers. And so could you talk a little bit about how you decided to bring those pop culture influences in and what it meant to um, give them kind of a new life within the poems? Oh my goodness. So like I said, I listen to music every day. I, and Prince has been the defining factor <laughs> in my life. I mean, there's a reason why all my tulips, oh, most when that first started planting were all purple. That's why there's a reason why purple is my favorite color. Um, even now my allium are about to bloom and they're purple. You know, there's a reason why I just gravitate toward the purple in my life because the purple one was always there for me in his language, his words, his sounds, his experimentation. That, that showed me that there was a way to go. He blazed such a furious path especially in the 80s every every year he put out something different and he took on a new persona he just you know whether it was from purple rain to around the world in the day to show the beatles influence to under the cherry moon and you know the parade album and the sign of the times a double album and let's not forget 1999 before purple rain was a double album so yeah uh and prince every and every image every year it was something different I mean, what a way to live, you know, what a way to have someone saying you can go out there and try different things and don't think just because you're black or from your Midwest or, you know, that you have to stay in some small regimented role. And so whew, that that told me a lot. Um, and with Prince and the good thing is I have to thank my parents because my parents were listening to Prince, you know, before I could read. And that's what really did it. And once I begin to think about the influence uh, for of Prince on me and think about those albums and the albums as I would see them, the Led Zeppelin album, because that, that Houses of the Holy, I'm like, how could anyone put out that album today with that cover? <laughs> you know, like, that's just not possible. Um, you know, there'll be a lot of people on their backs about that. Um, so it just, I begin to just have to go back from the petal to the stem to the seed of where did this all start? And that's where it all started. That artwork, I miss album covers. I really do. And to the point where my husband and I were talking about buying a new turntable. Um, but yeah, I had, to, I had to think about that. And for me, so much of what I see without language has an impact too. You know, it just rubs itself into me. And so much of what I think about when I think about music, I think about I think about little vignettes. I think about movies. I see movies in my head and I hear dialogue and I hear all the stuff that happens when I hear a song because I immediately go to place it. And so I wanted to figure out how I could honor that with the tool that I felt I had at my disposal, which was poetry. And so there's more to come, I think, for these, these album poems. I just finished a bop the other day. I was really excited. <laughs> um, I love so, that form. Yeah, that's awesome. It's so fun. And it was like, this. it's like the best form if you love music, because then you can begin to incorporate it into your own work, into the poetry, and let it have this conversation with your work. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I do hope that we 
we continue to see more of those music poems and um, the Prince poems, especially, you know, there's one about the album cover, but then there's the sequence, the, the Prince gospels. And um, I just loved how they really turned that idea of like biblical gospels on it, on their heads and also kind of positioned Prince in conversation with the goddesses as well through the book. Um, so that was really great. I see a lot of questions coming in the chat. Um, Greg mentions that there's a Spotify playlist for the book. So that's exciting. I'll try to find that link and post it in the chat so that we can all listen. Um, let me go back up. Um, oh, this is a question from Serena. Do you ever worry that reading others work, you'll end up imitating them and your work will be derivative? I, I don't in, I don't only because I think, um, if anything, I just get jealous. I mean, I've thrown many a book across the room um, only because the poem was so good. I was like, ah, why didn't I write that? Oh, <laughs> so no. And it's like, that is like my high praise sign. If I get so angry at your book and I like, like angry and I want to throw your book, it just means I loved it that much. <laughs> like I just couldn't stand it. Like there's that thing you say, I love you so much. I can't stand it. And it's like, I loved it so much. I couldn't stand it. Um, but I don't only because once I absorb it, it's like a spice. Like I can, I can eat as much pepper and salt and garlic as I want, but I won't turn into any of things, you know? And so it's like, I can absorb it, but when it comes out of my hand and out of my head, it only comes out with my voice attached to it. Like, but I will take things that I like, you know, um, and play around with them because I don't have the same lexicon as the other poets. I don't have the same syntax. I don't, you know, things change for me. And when they come in to me, they come out with my stamp on me. So I don't, and I really love what people do. I just, when I take it into me and try and do it, it just comes out with my spin on it. it it's always going to sound like me to me. So but I love to read it. I mean, cause goodness knows if that was the case, I'd be writing Lucille Clifton poems day after day after day um, because of how much I read her work. I was just reading homage to my hips earlier today <laughs> and cutting greens and thinking about those poems. So, but I just, what they do for me is they open doors to different ways in which I can express myself. And that's, that's what I enjoy about reading other people's work. They just open doors for me. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I do think that there is a way that sometimes that fear can creep in like, oh, are, are we are we becoming too much like like what we're reading, but um, the the inventiveness and experimentation and just different avenues of building images and form and the line, I think, is what makes us better poets um, and better writers. I always say everyone should read more poetry to be a better writer because it just opens up so many um, threads and possibilities. No, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I think no matter what I read, if I, like I said, I can't, I can't mimic it. I'm not a good mimicker. Like I can't even do accents well, um, <laughs> but, but I can take it into me and pull, you know, take it. And when it comes back out, it comes out with my spin. And, and but I love seeing all the, the differentiation. I love seeing just the experimentation. I, I, I find it so fulfilling and just, I don't know, exciting. Yeah, yeah, the, it's always exciting to see a poem that is doing something really inventive and um, something that you, you never would have thought to do, but when you read it, you're like, oh, wow. Like, I wish I thought, <laughs> I wish I thought of that. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, that's why the book gets thrown. Um, because I <laughs> wish I thought of it. <laughs> but then that lights the fire to to write other poems right exactly. and so it's it's a great a great loop a great cycle yes um heather is asking if you could talk about the work it takes to make space for writing as both a mom and a worker how do you protect that writing space um the best way i could protect it was marrying a poet um <laughs> because he understood instinctively um and we have you know it's like it's not even a, a spoken rule. It's just something that happens. If I see him writing a poem, I will whisk the children away to another room and give him time and space. And they're old enough now that they know 
if I say I'm writing a poem, they'll leave me alone and they'll let me go. But before they got to this stage, the only way I could really create that time was going away. It just, I had to go to a residency and I, um, I would, I would, I would get a lot of gruff from poets because I would go to a residency for like a week and come out with like 10 poems because they're all back there mm -hmm. and they just needed that time. I needed time away from, from mothering and from being a wife to be me, Terry, the poet, because if my kids are around, I'm always going to be like, okay, do you have a snack? Are you hungry? Where'd that scratch come from? Who did that to you? And you know, like, and just, and I'm always going to mother if they're around. And so it's, you know, but if I can get away and really get away, then, oh, it's on, <laughs> it's really on. And, and the poet in me is like, okay, take all the books you ever wanted to read. <laughs> and then, and then that's what happens. Um, and, and I, and I get that chance, but I will say it's really helpful when Hayes just, when my husband just whisks them away and as they've gotten older now, they, they understand it and appreciate it. And I'm really happy to model for them a way of living a life where you can do what you're passionate about and have it work for you and provide a living for you. Yeah, that's so important. I mean, even thinking of, of finding, you know, that idea of a work-life balance, but also a, a balance of, of being able to do your passion that's also part of your work. And I think sometimes, I know for myself, I'm always like, ah, oh, I'll get to the poetry later. I'll, I'll do that later. And it's so easy to brush it aside when, when you feel like you don't have the time and space to, to really pay attention to it. So those residencies can really come in handy just to give you that, that breathing room um in in time to to get it all out on the page yes um let me go through wow there's so many questions coming in this is great um do you set aside the same time every day to write or um how many hours do you work at once from christine i i don't and i i envy people who can do that um it always feels like the minute i get out of the bed because there's there's the difference between waking up and getting out the bed because <laughs> I will hold off in that bed for a while until I have to get out but the minute I get out I'm 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 you know helping my son with his pandemic hair because it's really long um I'm helping my daughter with her outfits I'm pulling together breakfast because she won't eat breakfast and I'm doing I have to do all the mother things I have to make sure he remembers his wallet or his phone um and so I, I can't really set that. I shouldn't say I can't. It's harder for me to do it and to stay consistent with it. So I tend to rely a lot on getting away, um, which made this year hard because mm -hmm. there was no residency. There was no opportunity to get away. Um, but I do wish that I could I could have that kind of discipline. I, I can barely have the discipline to get up and make sure I work out before all of this happens. Um, so one step at a time. I won't say I won't happen in the future, but one step at a time. Yeah, yeah. I know this past year has really been kind of the, the wake up call um, with regards to to finding that time and carving out that time without residencies being readily available. Um, yeah. So I have a question in the chat um, from an iPhone. So I'm sorry, I don't have a name, but um, can you offer any advice to an aspiring black female poet wanting to publish in advance in the field? Um, well, I think one of them is just to read as much as you can. And then also not just reading books, but reading journals. Because then once you find those journals, you can figure out if they're publishing work that maybe speaks to the kind of work you're creating and sending that work in and it's just plugging away at it I, I think i had my i had my first publishing credit in 1999 and from then on and but that was 1999 and it was 2016 when my book came out so that was what 17 years of writing with no book you know so uh yeah it just you just have to kind of keep plugging away at it and figuring out spaces that are hospitable and nurturing to you 
as a writer and nurturing to your work. Um, and I think once you get that down and once you accumulate enough, you know, publishing uh, credits, you begin to feel a confidence and a validation that I think then can inspire you to, to move forward to, to getting a book published. And I mean, I, I cast my net, you know, kind of far and wide the second book um, and, and was about to cast my net far and wide for the first one when, when everything kind of happened with that. Could you talk a little bit about the publishing process for the second book? Did you just send it out to a bunch of contests? Did you have conversations with different editors you were in contact with before um, getting this book into publication? I sent it to a lot of contests and um, I, was, I was really <laughs> excited when I got the call from Kathy Bacon that uh, Ohio State University would take it for the Charles B. Willer Prize. Um, and at that point I had to yank it from all these other contests, but I mean, hey, that's not a bad, that's not a bad thing. Um, right. <laughs> so that was, that was my process. And it was kind of a storybook with the first one, um, you know, and the, a publisher actually approached me at a reading and said, hey, I heard you had a manuscript. Thank you, Robert, always my hero um, for that, for Javal Press. Um, so it just, it was at that point, in between Hank coming out and A More Perfect Union coming out, I really create, I really fine tuned my radar for book prizes because I knew I had the second book pending. Mm -hmm. uh, and as soon as Hank came out, all of a sudden it was like the floodgates opened and whoosh, I started writing so many poems. And I knew, you know, working in poetry, you, you see what presses are publishing what, and so you begin to kind of connect those presses with a type of work. And I begin to try and figure out where could I find a home for this book. And I was willing to try lots of places though, because sometimes it may be the case where you may not see your work there, but they might, they, you know, that editor might. And so I never want to block, I never want to say no first to myself. I want to at least put it out there and give the give the world a chance to say yes before I shut it down. So it was it was a lot of just a wide distribution, a wide net, and then like I said, I was just really really excited and happy and thankful to get this call from Kathy Fagan. Yeah, yeah, no, that's so important not to say no to yourself. I think that that initial hesitancy, even just submitting work to literary journals, you know, not wanting to, to get those impending rejections can hold so many of us back from even just doing the work of submitting. And it's so important to, to be able to give yourself permission to take that step and not hold yourself back from possibility because you never know who's going to encounter those poems and love them and want to see them out in the world. So that's super important. Yes. Uh, Tara Betts is wondering hey. about two books. Um, which book has been most influential for your writing overall? And what book have you been recently obsessed with? Any genre? That's a great uh, question. That is a great question. <laughs> um, anything by Lucille Clifton has always been really helpful. But also, I would say Mother Love by Rita Dove and um, Eyes Work, uh, that The Killing Floor, like that that um, what she did with Persona was a precursor to the goddess poems. Mm -hmm. Just the idea that you could do so much with Persona and you could experiment with Persona. Um, that was a precursor to those goddess poems too. Because like Prince, that let me know that there's a world out there I can explore and things I could do that I might not have initially thought or given myself permission to do. Um, books that I've been obsessed by, oddly enough, <clears throat> uh, cast. Isabel Wilkerson. Um, that's been one just because I can't, I feel like every other line I was reading in there was like a poem prompt mm -hmm. <laughs> for me. Like, oh, this is triggering so much. This is just like bringing up so many good things for me to think about. Um, and I know right now, less book, but more show. I'm really um, kind of obsessed with Exterminate All the Brutes on HBO and HBO Max, that four part mm -hmm. documentary. Um, by Raul Peck. I, um, I just think it's incredible. And it's made me want to go back and like read Howard Zinn's work and just read, read a lot more um, when I get an opportunity later this summer. Um, and I'm trying to think, and then poetry books. I mean, I'm reading so many poetry books. I, you know, I was rereading Deaf Republic um, by Ilya Kaminsky and I was just oh, 
heartbreaking and good. Um, so I'm, I'm just trying to think. I, I really did love No Ruined Stone by Shara McCullum, which is not out yet. Sorry. Uh, it'll come out. <laughs> I know it'll come out in August uh, from Alice James Books. Um, but it's so good. It's so, so good. Uh, yeah. So, but yeah, it's a little bit all over the place. And I was really in love with N.K. Jameson's work. And I mean, I still am. Um, just because Afrofuturism is, is just, I wish Afrofuturism had been more of a thing when I was younger. Mm. Another way to see myself and another way to imagine myself in, in unlimited and boundless territory. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Tara, for that question. So, so many good um, recommendations for us all to check out. Um, let me scroll back through, maybe pop back over to other questions here. Um, I did want to touch a little bit about um, place in these poems. And, and you mentioned traveling and, and getting some time away as well in between um, first book and, and this book. But um, could you talk a little bit about how you dealt with writing poems about some of these places like Ohio, Ireland, the DMV, the South, which, you know, have conflicting and, and complicated pasts and how you kind of bring those pasts to light within the poems themselves? Ireland was a toughie because there, it was before I went. Um, and of course, you know, the gateway drug for all this was Irish poets, <laughs> just like one of the best exports they have. Um, so, I mean, you know, if you don't dig Shane Mancini, uh, I don't know what to say, um, you know, but no, but like, it, it, Ireland was a toughie because it's such a complicated history, but at the same time, there's always been inroads to me because of my family lore saying that we had, we had Irish ancestry and, you know, thanks to ancestry.com, I found out it was on both sides. So who knew? Um, and, and so I always felt an affinity for Irish culture because of their love of poetry. And I also had the words of my aunt who traveled the world um, as what they used to call an airline stewardess. Um, and she, once I asked her, I said, you know, where would you live outside of the US? Even then, I think as a, as a child, I knew that you know, we had issues. Um, and I said, well, where would you live if you didn't live in America? And she said, Scotland or Ireland. Those are the two best places to her that were more, really more hospitable to black people in her experience. And she's you know, six foot tall, striking woman. Um, so I've always had Ireland in the back of my head as somewhere that could be a home. And then to find a home in the voices of Irish poetry um, and then to go there and having found friends there, um, some incredible poets, uh, Siobhan Campbell, Jane Clark, um, Paula Meehan, Tail Dorgan, um, and they're in just so the warmth and their hospitableness, hospitality, it, it made me fall in love with the, with the country even more. Um, so I wanted to do it justice um, uh, in terms of writing about it. And I knew that wading into the complicated history of Ireland, I didn't feel equipped per se to do that. All I could say was here's what I'm seeing and here's how I'm experiencing it. And the same, I felt more agency with the South because even though I was born and raised in Cleveland, my mother was born and raised in Little Rock, Arkansas. And my father, his parents were born and raised in Bessemer, Alabama. Um, so, and I had a, a host of, of great aunts and uncles. My grandmother was one of like 13. And so I have a host of great aunts and uncles all from Arkansas. And so I would go down to visit. So I met my great grandmother, you know, and I met my great grandmother on both sides of my family. Actually, I, had, I was very privileged to, to know them and to meet my great grandfather too on my paternal side. And so I had this link to the South and I had this claim that I wanted to throw out there and say, just because I will rep my city of Cleveland, Ohio, doesn't mean I don't know about the South. And so I wanted to get that in there. And I had been recording my grandmother in like the last like three to five years of her life. And so I was hearing these incredible stories that felt like home to me too. And I wanted to honor that. And so place is huge for me because when I go, I don't just go somewhere without researching. 
I try to research it. I try and read uh, poems by people from that area. I try and read letters, expat letters. Um, and even going to France was great because there's such a great history of Black expats in, in France. Um, and I have a cousin who lives in London. So it was like I got a chance to learn all this history about the places I would go. And that gets filtered through my consciousness and it comes out on the page because it's the, what's steady, what's the constant in all those things, me. And so it's really just how I experience it, but it's more than that because poetry is also more than the I. You know, it's, it's about the ways in which we filter knowledge and information and experiences and connect them to a general, and, a general humanity and, and a growing consciousness. And so that's why place is so important to me because I feel like I'm looking for ways in which we connect as humans. Right. And I wanna explore that connection. And that's what I try and do. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, I, I'm always so drawn into these poems in this collection that transport us to these different places, but really let us sit in the history, not just one narrative experience, but really kind of bringing a full, a fuller picture um, through the speaker's um, retelling of, of narrative and history and interweaving. And I think that that was just so um, masterfully done throughout the collection. Um, I did want to, to so we don't forget, um, lots of requests for either a link to the Spotify playlist or the playlist title. I try to do a little bit of Googling, but I'm not the best multitasking while I'm on here. Um, but hopefully we can, um, it can be easy enough to find for people who are interested in that oh, sort of. I am in it now. I will put it, uh, I will put it in the chat. Uh, there's book two, mixtape one. Uh, yeah. So, Wonderful. Yeah. And that one only has eight songs. And it's like, but it's, it's some Donna Summer, some Cannonball Adderley, some Hozier, The System, Little Dragon, because there were some, some, um, music poems that didn't make mm. the the book, but I still like, you know, uh, the one I wrote out there, Hosier's from Eden, um, was, was printed in the Gordon Square Review in Cleveland. Um, I'm always trying, I can never figure out which, which is the best way to share a link. Um, Cause I never think, there you go. Well, there you go. Oh, sorry. I'm going to do this. Sorry, Greg. Hi, Greg. I sent that just to Greg, but I need to send that to everyone. <laughs> no, that's great. There's also a way that um, putting together a collection is sort of like putting together a playlist, really kind of curating the movement between pieces. Is that something that you, you think about when you um, organize your poems? I do. I do. I try and think about um, ways in which these poems are talking to each other. I try and think about um, ways in which there are themes that maybe connect or there's a, a gradual elevation. Um, so I try and have all those things in mind when I'm thinking about the order in the book and what to do and where to put things and what, what, what can stay and what might not make it into this one or what has to go somewhere else. Right, right, and it becomes sort of a full, full circle moment with this collection. I, I don't wanna end um, without talking about the title poem, which, which comes at the very end of the collection. But of course, by reading the title of the collection, we're kind of primed for, for experiencing that poem at the end. Could you talk about, um, you know, what was your decision like putting that poem at the end, that kind of final, um, you know, epistolary form, Dear America, beginning the poem, and um, really taking us through not just history, but up to the current moment um, with everything that was happening with regards to the presidency and the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement and, and all of these things, which I'm sure became a lot more urgent as this book was in production. Um, but yeah, could you just talk about that, the kind of movement through the collection to that final poem? Uh, yeah, and that final poem, um, it came from actually a night after teaching June Jordan's a poem about my rights. 
um, to my Shakespeare sisters class at the Folger, which is like a, a seminar I co-teach with Kim Roberts, where we go from female poets from Shakespeare's times to the present. We've retooled it to Shakespeare's sisters say her name, where it's just uh, black women poets from Phyllis Wheatley to Trace K. Smith. But I just taught that poem and read it to the class and cried when I read it because I can't help but cry when I read that. And um, it, it, I tossed and turned all night and woke up at like 3.30 or so in the morning and wrote that poem. I was up for like an hour. Um, and I was like, that's a hit I'll take. I'll, mm. I'll, I'll miss that sleep um, and that's okay uh, because I had to get this poem out. But it didn't start that way. It started off as like an outline poem. And then I realized that it couldn't live that way. Um, so it became this epistolary poem because I, I've i always been really fascinated with poets who kind of break that fourth wall and like, dear reader, dear reader. And I love it. I, I just think it's so fun and it's a little arch and you know it's a way to really connect. And I really want to connect to this country. And I really have a lot of thoughts <laughs> about this country. <laughs> as you know as someone who worked on capitol hill and worked in the capitol building and i realized I, that's who i needed to talk to it was like I, I needed to talk to america because there are things i wanted to say but then i realized maybe america's not listening it's not it's not listening for me it's not listening to me and it hasn't um so maybe that's not who i need to talk to and i just had to get all of that out and it was it was hard um because I, I have so much emotion in that poem. Um, but I also felt like a letter was the best way I could, I could exercise it too. Like that was the best way in which I could do this. Cause I couldn't take the eye out of myself. I couldn't take the eye out of that one. I, I had to leave her in there. Um, and then, you know, I did feel some sort of pressure about naming it after the mm -hmm. book. <laughs> and I was just like, well, it's just gonna have to be what it's gonna have to be. <laughs> And sometimes you're just like, I just got to let it go and let it go out of my hands and fly away and just have peace with that. Because if I keep holding on to it, I'm going to pluck this bird of every single feather and it will never fly. Um, so, so yeah, no, it had to go. And that was the best way forward for me. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's just a perfect way to end the collection, especially with that epistolary form, because we've been getting these different voices through the goddesses and then the speakers of the poems. And then it kind of all culminates in this letter to, to America and to the reader. And I love the way that the title, A More Perfect Union sort of shifts throughout because we could think of, of course, the reference to, to the constitution, but also um, a, a marriage union or a family union or a union of, um, person to place and there's all these different relationships that kind of come to mind with that and then of course it gives us um the the initial reference point right at the end and I thought that was just a great full circle moment there thank you thank you yeah there's just um yeah for me I I feel like we're on the precipice if we do this right we're on the precipice of becoming a better nation if we do this right and I just, I really, I, I just want to implore the citizens of this country to do it the right way, to be intentional about equality and representation and voice. And I'm not an elected official, so I can't use that platform, but I can use the page and I can use a poem. And there we go. I don't know how, how much better we can end tonight's conversation than with those those final words. Um, thank you so much, Terry, for, for sharing your time with us and, and your generous answers to all of our questions. And of course, for sharing this lovely collection with us as well. Um, I hope that everyone who's here is making their purchases if they haven't already. Um, please, please, please go enjoy this collection and, and spend time with these poems. Well, thank you so much, Emily, for your time and attentiveness to the book. And I appreciated these questions so much. Um, this is such a great opportunity to talk about the craft behind it.